Hello, I'm Maria Hall Brown. Thank you for joining us. I heard once that when you speak, you are saying what you know, but when you listen, you have the chance to learn. Today, we're going to hear some great stories from people that we can learn from. And we're delighted to be joined by Councilman Curran Price from District 9, as well as some incredible young people. I'd like to introduce you to Robert, Alondra, Daniel, Karime, Keith, Margarita, Margarita and, Isaac. and Isaac. We're delighted that you're all here. So thanks for joining us. You actually have witnessed personally change or mm -hmm. the manifestation of change or the, the tumultuous times mm -hmm. that had to mm -hmm. place, mm -hmm. take place because of change. Because you had a lot of firsts. You were the first student body president of your school of African American descent. Well, yes, you know, but, but my experience is based on 69 years right. as a black man in America. Uh, and so uh, that's why the, the demonstrations that have been going on today is certainly filled with protest, but also promise. And that's why I'm so excited. Never before in my life uh, have I seen the convergence of uh, individuals coming together, talking about the impact and the effects of racism. Uh, and acknowledging it and figuring out where we go from here. And so this is an exciting time to be able to talk about these issues and to talk about them in terms of what can we do to solve the problem. Uh, you know, in the uh, uh, in council uh, last week, I mentioned that, uh, you know, we certainly have benefited from many teachable moments right. uh, over the years, you know, going back to the uh, civil rights days, uh, to the demonstrations on campus that I was a part of, uh, to the anti-war protests, uh, and of course, uh, every time there is a black man or a woman or child murdered uh, in our country at the hands of the police or, or, or some other force, uh, we, we're always told it's a teachable moment, we need to do better moving forward. Well, the, the days of, of doing better are now, and so I think uh, the demonstrations in the streets have indicated that folks want to see some change, they, they don't want talk, they don't want promises, but they want to see some systemic changes that impact quality of life for African Americans uh, and other minorities in our community in, in ways that we have not seen before. And, and, but, but I'll tell you, the reason I did bring up the fact that you were a student in a time like that is that here are these young people who are also facing their future, looking at what they want. And I know that they have some very serious questions. So if that's all right with you, let's let's see what they need let's to see. All yes. right. All right. Well. Um, I'm going to actually let you decide who wants to ask Curran the first question. So go ahead and raise your hand and, and I'll be able to acknowledge you because I know that you have some very important things that you would like to get across. All righty. Go for it, Isaiah. Um, hi, uh, my name is Isaiah and I go to Crenshaw High School. Um, but my first question to you is do you see any differences from the riot, race riots back in the 60s compared to now? Well, I wouldn't really call them race riots. They were certainly uprisings and, and uh, expressions of concern, expressions of frustration uh, that were uh, a part of the discussion uh, in those days. Uh, and I think there are a couple of distinctions. Certainly this time it's a more multicultural, multi-ethnic uh, discussion, multi-generational. Uh, discussion uh, about uh, how black people specifically are treated and how uh, minorities are underrepresented in, uh, in, in all aspects of our life. Uh, this time uh, there seemed to be a lot more information, a lot more communication. Uh, the students uh, of today, uh, citizens of today are benefiting you know, from the 30, 40 years of, of protest uh, that came before. Uh, and so I see them building upon uh, on that and also uh, using technology in a way that we have not seen before to communicate. You know, the, the, the cell phone provides pictures, picture evidence of misconduct, of uh, things said and done in ways that we just did not have before. And so uh, I'm excited, as I said, it's an opportunity for protest, but also a promise. Uh, so I'm excited about uh, the foundation that has been laid by those who protested uh, before. Uh, in the, in the, before the 60s, but the, during the 60s, uh, uh, through the current time. Uh, and we know that we have to all be involved to really make a difference. And so that's, what's, uh, that's what the, the difference is. Uh, uh, we have a much broader group of individuals involved, but what's 
same is we want change and we want equality. Amen. Isaiah, are we congratulating you? Did you just graduate? I am actually graduating June 12th. Okay. So, yeah. All right. Congratulations. Thank you. Well, thank you. And I think that's a really important you know, piece of this puzzle. There are specific things that have to happen in order for change to take place. You know, you talk about talk, that that's not enough. Mm -hmm. How does the how do, how do policies get changed? How do things actually move forward? How is progression actually done? Well, I'm, I'm excited to, uh, to report that the uh, city council and the mayor, I think, have taken some steps to, to provide that kind of leadership, to provide those kinds of changes. Changes have been uh, proposed, for example, uh, with the police department. Right. Uh, in terms of a greater civilian oversight, um, the ability to have an independent, they've agreed to an independent uh, prosecutor if there is police misconduct that had been resisted for, for many, uh, for, for a long time. So we see these changes in, in policy kind of evolving slowly but surely. Uh, in terms of uh, our priorities, our spending priorities, our, or uh, the mayor is proposing some dramatic shifts uh, in, in programming that provides additional resources for communities of color specifically in ways that we have just not seen before. Uh, and so we don't know exactly uh, how those programs are going to roll out, how they're going to be implemented, but just having the conversation about shifting $250 million out of the budget uh, for these purposes is revolutionary. It's not been done before. And, and some of that money, however, is coming from the police department's budget, is it not? That, that's correct. As a matter of fact, uh, I was with a group of, uh, of legislators that proposed that uh, $100 million come out of the police budget mm -hmm. for these purposes. And again, not trying to defund the police, but just recognizing that, we, that every department has to take uh, some responsibility and has a role to play in, in trying to meet these needs. And so uh, resources are short. We don't know how these resources are going to be spent. I'm on the budget committee. I'm excited to be there. Uh, and so I'm going to be actively engaged in the discussion with how these funds are going to be reprogrammed and reallocated. But it's also going to be an opportunity for citizens to have input and have say-so uh, and to open up this budget in a way that we haven't done before. And I'm, I'm excited about the prospects. Okay. And then also, I mean, as far as how uh, any kind of horrible, untoward, bad behavior as far as the police department is concerned currently mm -hmm. there is an internal investigation but then it goes to the DA's office and there might be some well, concerns it, yeah, there. yes it does and, and, and that's why uh, the, the, the police commission has agreed to uh, employ an independent prosecutor uh, when uh, when necessary so that uh, there is a independent pair of eyes on uh, suspected uh, wrongdoing or abuse uh, and this has been a lo issue long time issue uh, with the community uh, and the police department uh, has resisted that. So that was a, this is a positive step forward. I think generally we're talking about more accountability, uh, more transparency, uh, and that's good for government wherever it occurs. And that actually is a perfect segue because we've got Keith's question. So let's, let's see, Keith, because I actually know what you said now. So thank you, and it's really an important thing to ask. Um, we saw what happened, you know, via video and, and mm -hmm. everything. But what Keith wants to know is, when will justice come to cases that have no media attention? I mean, yeah. that's, uh, that's... That's a great, great question. Great question, Keith. And, and it's one that uh, uh, certainly we all are very, very concerned about. Uh, obviously, those cases that uh, uh, are publicized, uh, that are caught on tape, uh, caught on camera, uh, now do have a whole nother level of, uh, of visibility. Uh, and we know that there are thousands of other situations uh, where uh, that did not occur. Uh, and so we're hopeful that we can create a new sense of environment, uh, a new sense of awareness, uh, so that individuals will think twice before they conduct those bad acts, uh, and that when those bad acts are seen, or viewed, or are heard, they're reported. Uh, and that when they are reported, there's some action taken. Uh, I think that the demonstrators uh, have been clear that they want government to be more responsive. Uh, they want to make sure that bad acts don't occur, but when they do occur, that the individuals who are responsible are, are um, prosecuted appropriately. Because he's right. I mean, things that happen in a vacuum or things that happen mm -hmm. without the attention, it becomes a situation that it's my word yes. is their word. And yeah. that, that must be a very terrifying scenario. Well, it, it, it has been terrifying. Yeah, you know, we had the example of uh, uh, 
the gentleman that was uh, bird watching in Central Park. Right. Uh, and the, uh, you know, asked the lady to, uh, you know, leash the dog. And she said, I'm not going to leash the dog and, and I'm going to report you for, for being uh, hostile to me, you know, blah, 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 blah. Just completely out of line, totally uh, inappropriate. Uh, but people will get away with these kinds of things if there is no oversight, if there is no transparency, uh, if there is no way to check what's going on. And so we have a, uh, a citizenry uh, today that is, uh, I think, more activist prone. And we have technology now that helps to turn each of us into a reporter, if you will. Yeah. Alert Reporting alert. good acts and bad acts. Yes, yeah, definitely. All right. Ah, did we get Kareem back? There she is. Uh, Hi. All right, let's see if we can hear your question. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, yes. perfect. So, good morning. My name is Karina Reyes. I am a graduate from Alliance. Yes. How do you see your new um, academy? So, to Councilman Price, um, as we have seen in the past and in recent times, social media and the media in general holds, um, holds a lot of power in the being, such as uh, Black Lives Matter. Local news outlets have capitalized on the anger and the frustration and trauma of our communities for the lack of accountability on behalf of the, on behalf of the justice system for the murders of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Sandra Glenn, to name a few of the thousands who have died at the hands of law enforcement. Propelling this narrative of looting thugs as Donald Trump. Yes. Okay, so what she's saying is that the media has, you know, has focused on a lot of attention on Black Lives Matter, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But there's also been a focus on some of the negative, the anger and the trauma yes. um, on the communities for the lack of accountability on the behalf of the justice systems mm -hmm. uh, for the murders of George yeah. Floyd. Right. Well, I, I think I understand your question. And, and let me just say that we just have to hold our elected officials and appointed officials more accountable. Uh, we have to let them know that we expect a certain level of, of, uh, of programs and policies. Uh, and if they don't uh, follow through, they don't deliver, uh, that they're going to be subject to protests and to, to, and to demonstrations. Certainly uh, a very visible level has been the demonstrations we've had over the past several days in the streets. Uh, but that's not the only way to demonstrate. Uh, certainly writing letters, making phone calls, one-on-one -on -one conversations, very, very important. We want to increase the awareness, uh, the accountability, uh, and the transparency of what's going on. Uh, and working together, we can make that happen. But she's also very concerned about the focus of attention of the anger and the looting mm -hmm. and uh, not necessarily focusing on the promise right. and the hope of what is being going mm -hmm. on. And she was asking, you know, as a young generation, how do you share with your parents and those mm -hmm. around you the good that's happening and the hope and the, that sort mm -hmm. of thing? Mm -hmm. Because sometimes the narrative takes a negative it does, spin. Right. And, you know, and I think we got to utilize the tools that we have now, social media, in ways that we just have not had before, a way to get individual stories out, messages out, uh, to retweet the good things that are occurring, that are happening. Uh, you're right. The media does tend to, to focus on the negative, focus on what's wrong, focus on what's not happening. And that is especially true in minority communities. That's been a, uh, a criticism we've had for many times, for, for a long period of time, uh, that the mainstream, the mainstream press and media don't tell our stories. Uh, they don't tell what's really happening in our communities. They don't share, they don't share the good stories uh, and the good things that are, are done. They're just focusing on the negative. And so again, it's up to us to, to turn that narrative around, uh, to call out the media when it is being uh, uh, biased, when it's not being accurate, uh, when it's not being uh, comprehensive in this point of view. Uh, and for us as individuals uh, to call that out and say we're not going to take it anymore. Nice. Thank you. All right. Who's, who's going to boldly go and try to ask a question through this wonderful technology that we're playing with right now? Let's go to Robert next. Okay, Robert. Oops, I'm sorry. Okay, okay we're going to call out on Robert. Hello. Hi, hey, Robert. Robert. Hey, Robert. I'm from Animal Jack Robinson. How can we as a community provide more support towards community efforts and organizations outside of the police forces in order to prevent police brutality and violence in the future? A very good question, Robert. Uh, and let me just say again, repeating a theme of that I said earlier, uh, we just have to hold individuals more accountable. Our elected officials especially have to be accountable for what's going on. To do that, we need to be informed. We need to be informed of programs, be informed of policies, understand them. Uh, not be afraid to have those discussions uh, with our, our teachers, 
uh, with the uh, uh, elected officials, with our peers, with our parents, making them aware of what's going on, making sure they understand uh, uh, what, the, what the implications are and, and what the uh, challenges are, and what your point of view is. Uh, you know, you've got your developing points of view, uh, things that you like, things you don't like, things that you don't understand. And so don't be afraid to express those, to indicate uh, what you like, what you don't like. And when you, when you see areas that need to be changed, speak out on it. Uh, but to do that, you got to be informed. You have to be knowledgeable. And uh, everybody has a responsibility, I think, and an opportunity uh, to speak up uh, and to express themselves, expressing the things they like and also the things they don't like. Uh, and so that responsibility rests with all of us. One of the things you were talking about is moving some of this budgetary money into community programs. Mm -hmm. And that I think that's a lot also what uh, Robert's asking about is yeah. outside the police force, you yeah. know, what kind of community support can people yeah. actually tangibly, physically do to uh, enhance the sure. visibility of a community, the good that people are doing, mm -hmm. and all that kind of stuff? He's well, really well, for example, as we talk about moving uh, monies around, I, I think we should be putting uh, additional monies into uh, job training activities, especially for our youth. We need to be figuring out how we can expand our summer youth program so that we have, uh, you know, not 20,000 uh, youth employed during the summer, but 50,000 youth uh, employed during the summer, uh, getting experiences uh, and income that will that will help. So it's impossible. It's, it's important that we uh, make sure that uh, that programs are in place and that we're doing what we can to help advance that. So uh, health programs. Uh, social service uh, programs are going to be important. The employment programs are going to be important. Uh, making sure the infrastructure changes uh, 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 represent uh, are represented throughout the community. We want our streets uh, well paved. We want to see the street lights. We want to see uh, paving. We want to see uh, signage. Uh, we want to see all the things that occur in other areas. We want to make sure they're happening in our community. And in the past, that just hasn't happened. And so. Uh, the added voice of constituents who are rising up saying that uh, we demand equality, we, we demand transparency, uh, we demand uh, greater uh, involvement, I think is timely and it's necessary right now. Chris, I saw you, but I'll get you in a second because I want to I wanna go ahead and let Margarita have a second here. So Margarita, um, thanks for joining. Uh, what's your question for Councilman Price? Hello. Hello, my name is Margarita Bagona. I'm from Dr. Maya Angela Community High School. And my question is concerning the curfew alerts. Um, these alerts are only available in English, and I think that that puts our community in a possible danger. Could you propose that these alerts be possible in Spanish and other languages? And also, why were these alerts imposed now that people are protesting, but not before when we were trying to deal with coronavirus? Well, a very good question, Margarita. Thank you for asking. You know, the the curfew is a is a tool that the that's used by the uh, by the police and other authorities to help keep the streets safe uh, and and clear uh, during uh, times of of turmoil and uncertainty. Uh, the ability to clear the streets is certainly one way to help uh, restore restore order. Uh, the purpose of the curfew is not to punish or to uh, make it difficult for those who are legally expressing themselves and, and, and protesting and, and expressing their points of view, uh, but more designed for those who uh, have uh, illegal intent uh, in, their, in their minds, being able to uh, wreck the kind of destruction and havoc that we've seen occur uh, at nightfall uh, with the looting uh, and the burning and, and all. Uh, I, I'm ex I think it's promising to note that uh, there's a good chance that the, uh, the, the curfew in our city is going to be lifted uh, now that uh, we are uh, resuming more a more peaceful approach, uh, but it is a necessary tool. And I agree with you, it needs to be transmitted in not just uh, English, but also in Spanish. Uh, the, the community that I represent is almost 80% uh, Latino, for example. And so we always make sure that uh, anything we do is in English, uh, is in Spanish, uh, but there are other languages as well. And we must, we must make sure that we're communicating um, equally across the board in an effective way. Uh, so that people understand what we're doing and why we are doing it. Right, and she did mention, you know, during the the Safer at Home initiative and everything, nothing like that happened, but what did the curfew give the right for law enforcement to do over and above uh, what a Well, the, the, the right is to, is to clear the streets, okay. to ask individuals to go home. You know, we're not trying to imprison or, or cordon off individuals, uh, but if they've got... Uh, 
um, uh, a legal reason to be out on the street. They're going to a job, coming from a job, going somewhere. That's all they had to say. That's exactly. one thing. Okay. Exactly. Exactly. Right. exactly. Because I think there was some misinformation. Yeah. I mean, even I was wondering, you know, I have never lived through a curfew. So, yeah. and, and obviously, I don't think any of us have. Yeah. Well, it's, it's a scary thing, obviously. You know, when you're clearing the streets and the police say, get off the streets or you're going to be arrested. Uh, it's, it's, it's a way to uh, 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 exert control, uh, to provide greater safety for the broader community. It's not really intended to uh, impact or to uh, uh, cause uh, problems for those that are acting lawfully, but those who are unlawfully assembling and doing things they shouldn't do, it's a way for the police to, to identify them and to get them off the street. Right, I got it. Chris, <laughs> nice to see you. Hi, Chris. My name is Christian Mugberly. I'm an attending senior at Catch Prep Charter High School. Why do you personally think this generation of youth decided to fight back as hard as we have compared to other generations? Oh, interesting. Yeah, good, good question. Well, I think, first of all, this generation is, is much more informed. They certainly have uh, not just heard the reports, but have seen uh, instances of, uh, of uh, acts of violence uh, against individuals uh, on their cell phones, on TV. Uh, in the uh, in the media, and as I said before, I think that the demonstrators today are standing on the shoulders of those who have demonstrated, you know, over the decades. This is not a new issue. It's not a, uh, a problem that has just evolved. The, the issues of racism and in, unjust treatment, uh, but it's come to a boil, and, and individuals are just saying, "Hey, enough is enough." And so I give this generation credit for uh, standing tall. As I said, the protests we've seen have been multi-generational, multi-ethnic, uh, and certainly people are tired uh, of the treatment, the, the uh, unfair, uh, illegal treatment that some citizens receive, especially at the hands of, uh, of the police. And so uh, it's an this has been an opportunity for individuals to come together, certainly centering around the death of, uh, of uh, Lloyd, the individual that was uh, unfairly, uh, that was murdered, I, I'll say, at the hands or at the knee uh, of a policeman. That was certainly the instigating factor, but that, you know, there have been, been deaths and there have been murders and there have been problems with the police uh, for years and years and years. And so uh, this has been an opportunity to come together identifying this particular problem, but also identifying a broader problem. And again, to the credit of, of elected officials here in Los Angeles, we are taking this as a chance to really make some systemic changes uh, in the way we move forward. So hopefully we don't have to have these kinds of incidents in the future. I'm going to tag team on something and I have a note that you had a, an additional question and about uh, youth being negatively affected. Is that true? Yeah. So, uh, so what do you think youth is most negatively affected by? And what do you think will correct? Well, this? I think the youth are just negatively affected by not having programs that are responsive and that uh, meeting the needs that students have. Uh, you know, we need to make sure that all of our students are receiving the kind of support, extracurricular and other support that's necessary, not just in the classroom, uh, but out of the classroom with extracurricular activities. We got to make sure that all of our youth have opportunities for job training, job uh, experiences during, uh, during the summer uh, and, and after school, uh, that they have access to um, programs that help to encourage them, STEM and STEAM programs that help encourage them for those that want to go on to college. We want to make sure that all of our youth uh, have access to these programs and for, unfortunately they all don't. Uh, in minority areas, uh, low-income areas, frequently these opportunities just don't exist uh, and those are disproportionately impacting uh, black and brown youth and so uh, I'm committed to making sure that we uh, change the table, making sure that resources are available, that they have access to pro programs that can really make a difference in their lives and, and also uh, that can provide a real foundation for the future. All right, I'm going to take what is called a poll vote, and that's literally just raise your hand. How many of you, obviously you are very forward thinking, you're with us today. How many of you feel as if you have power in your life to make change? All right, and the next question is, how many of you have actually felt as if you were not heard? Right. Interesting. Well, those you know, and those feelings are real. Uh, let, let me tell you, you know, we certainly the uh, we have a youth commission here uh, in the city of LA. It needs to be doing more. Uh, you know, we just uh, we passed some legislation that's going to provide a, uh, resources for a youth council, 
again, in ways that we have it, so that we can more formally get ideas, suggestions uh, from our youth. Uh, you guys are the future, uh, but you're also the present, and so we want to get you actively involved and engaged now uh, so that we can help lay the groundwork and the foundation. Again, we appreciate your, your, your activism and your involvement. I know many of you are active uh, uh, on your campuses, uh, you know, uh, with the community organizations, and that's the kind of activism that we need. That's the kind of experience I had when I was growing up. I was active in my church. I was active in, in student government. Uh, I was playing uh, little league sports. Uh, but I think a variety of those activities, coupled with a community that cared about me, that is concerned about me, uh, have been really important in my success. And so we want to make sure that we're providing you with that same kind of support, that same kind of, of, of uh, possibilities for the future that can make things different. And so we just appreciate your involvement. Alondra, I know that you are a very passionate person just based on the fact that I have lots of questions in front of me right now from you and and one of the things that I think is fascinating is that there's definitely a tone in your questions about supporting other uh, diverse groups I mean that may not be necessarily your community but you definitely have a, a sense of obligation to protecting other communities um, you were worried about the mayor's budget to the how is that beneficial to the police um, can you elaborate on that a little bit Yes, yeah, so my name is Alondra uh, from Nashville, New York. I am a current graduate from UCI in Queens. I study urban studies and political science. And so part of what I learned urban studies is the importance of budget. Uh, so budgets are a reflection of priorities. Uh, the major budget um, the allocated half of the budget, um, part of budget to policing. So how is that beneficial to the people of Los Angeles and policemen actually in the city of living? Another issue. Other issues like housing, medical, attention, education, and youth programs are not even priority with this budget. Why is that? And you can see just as why half the budget was going to go to police and how it truly has to have benefit the people of South well, you're right. The budget is a statement of our values. It's a statement of what we believe is important. Uh, and I think that's why it's significant that uh, the mayor and council are proposing a dramatic uh, reordering of priorities in this year's budget. Uh, the, the mayor talked about uh, reallocating uh, some $250 million to, so, to social programs, neighborhood programs, youth programs. Uh, the city council uh, uh, has suggested that $100 million of those dollars uh, come out of the police department uh, budget. Uh, so it's an effort to demonstrate that we do understand the importance uh, of, of funding. We do understand the importance of priorities and we understand the importance of making of addressing those priorities that impact uh, those citizens who have been uh, overlooked over the past, youth and others who have been overlooked. So uh, we're excited about this uh, this new program, and we're not quite sure where things are going to go. As I said, I sit on the budget committee; I'll be a part of those deliberations. But you'll also have a chance to have some input, to have some say so, and to talk about uh, increasing the youth programs, increasing the summer programs. Uh, increasing uh, after-school activities. Uh, this is an exciting time, as I said. It's a time of protest, but it's also a time of promise. Uh, and so I hope that you will continue to be engaged as we move forward. Uh, we are in some uncharted areas. Uh, we've never made a, a, a budget commitment like this, but it does reflect a, the priorities. It does reflect uh, values that our city has and that uh, our citizens want as we move forward. Alondra, did you say that you're studying criminal science? No, so the science urban studies. Oh, okay. And I was wondering if I could ask why is it taking so long? Because I feel like a lot of the budget yes. for big <clears throat> programs have been cut for many years. Right. Now that right. finally more money, well, and all of a sudden there's this new department created by the right. mayor. So why is that? Yeah, well, that that's what makes this time so exciting, uh, because after years and years and years and years of discussion. It, change is finally occurring, you know, and we know change doesn't happen overnight. It does take time sometimes. Uh, and so these changes that we're talking about uh, have certainly been talked about uh, in, in years past, uh, but we've got finally the political will to make things different. And so again, it's gonna be, it's, it's, it, we're being driven largely uh, by input that we received from citizens, youth like yourselves who are saying, hey, we want change, we want it now. We don't wanna wait another 20 years. We think things should occur now. 
and you've got elected officials who are agreeing with you and who are trying to make those things happen. Obviously, there are some activists who think it's not going, we're not going fast enough and not going far enough. You know, that, again, is also the, the tension that always exists. Uh, but I think you certainly have the attention now of elected leaders at the local, uh, state, and federal level who realize that we need to be doing some dramatic things differently. Uh, if we're serious about uh, making changes in our communities and about uh, positively impacting the lives of our young people as we move forward. All right, I want to ask a question to the group. How many of you were frustrated before we all learned about this tragedy and everyone took to the streets to, to protest? How many of you were already frustrated in your world? And and what was it? What What was, what, personal things happen to you or to your family or to you know your friends or the community that you lived in that just didn't it was just not right to you can you think of what it was raise your hand if there's something that okay absolutely has um i it's just about being black and brown in this type of community and you can't hear me can you hear me now? now we can. Yes, yes, yes. It's just about being black and brown in this community. You know, getting pulled over by the police is such a scary feeling. Um, seeing just seeing police lights in the back of your car is just uh, I, it's an indescribable feeling. Like it makes you tense up. So uh, seeing all this stuff happen on TV, I, I feel like it's about time we've stood up and did something about this. It's been going on for too long. So yeah, that's what I feel. Right. Absolutely. And, and, and listen, your feelings were felt by thousands and thousands of others, uh, youth and others around our city and around our country and around the world. You know, you know understand these demonstrations are occurring not just in oh, Los Angeles, not just in California, not just in the U.S., but also in other uh, countries around this world. And so this is a special time in our history, a special time in the history of the, not just our city, our country, but the world. Uh, when everyone is realizing that uh, now is the time for the changes that we need to make if we're serious about uh, creating a, a society of, of uh, equality uh, and fairness and equity. Great. Uh, Daniel, are you there? Yes, hi, good morning. Daniel. Can you hear me? Yes. What would you like to ask the councilman? Yes, um, good morning. My name is Daniel. I'm currently a student at Alliance Patty Peter North Leadership Academy. And my question to Councilman Price is, given the terror and the fear that has been striked upon the people of Los Angeles by LAPD, how do you, as a local representative, plan to address or rather dismantle the institution that is LAPD and create one that is a true embodiment of the diverse residents of Los Angeles and more so as an effort to give the power back to the people of Los Angeles? Well, we certainly want to make sure that uh, our, our police are community-oriented. We certainly have been encouraging a community-oriented policing uh, for, for many years, encouraging the officers to get to know the, the community that they're in, be a part of the community they're in. We have a number of programs that have been very successful. Uh, the the, the uh, Community Safety Program, for example, that uh, embeds officers uh, at, a, uh, on, at specific locations, specific parks in our area. It's been at South Park. Uh, and at uh, Pueblo del Rio, uh, in, uh, in District 8, it's been at Harvard Park. But these have been unique experiments uh, where the police are, are actually engaged with the community, providing programming, providing services, uh, everything from uh, after-school activities to, to youth leagues. And so we want to make sure that uh, officers realize that they are a part of the community. And we think that uh, the community policing is a way to make that happen. And it's important to have officers assigned to an area where they want to be. Those in the CSP program, for example, uh, apply uh, and are, are, are interviewed, if you will, and vetted uh, for a particular area. And so we think that uh, the police have a responsibility to be more accessible, more accountable, uh, more transparent. And uh, it's increasingly clear that the community uh, is demanding that kind of uh, uh, interaction, that kind of protection uh, from the police. We don't. Uh, uh, want to be in a police state, under, feeling that we're under siege, uh, you know, but the reality is that when in black and brown uh, uh, young men are stopped by the police, uh, you know, they're in fear of, uh, of being shot or, 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 or being arrested uh, or being detained uh, for a reason that uh, is certainly uh, 
uh, not appropriate and, and, and it is unnecessary. Uh, and so while these uh, memories still exist, it's important for us to try to change that narrative, uh, certainly by providing greater training, more sensitivity training uh, with our officers, uh, making sure the officers are, are more diverse, uh, and to make sure that the programs are more uh, community oriented so that individuals feel they are a part of what's going on. And I think we're making those, we're making those changes slowly. We need to do them faster, uh, but we have had instances of success we do have officers that do believe in community policing. Uh, you know, it's been evident uh, in the demonstrations. We've seen uh, officers uh, walking together uh, with demonstrators, holding hands, uh, hugging, uh, taking a knee, uh, doing the kinds of things that demonstrate that, hey, they are individuals too, and that they understand the, the pain uh, and the anguish uh, that citizens are feeling by taking the streets to demonstrate. All right, I have a question for the group again. Uh, speaking of policing, how many of you have had either a negative experience or an uncomfortable experience either personally or a family member or in your community with uh, an incident with a police policeman? Okay. That, I mean, that's a demonstration right there. Um, so yeah, when a, it comes a, scary, to a scary demonstration. A scary. And these are youth that are active, that are involved, that are you know doing stuff. Um, and even they have, even if not personally been, been subject to uh, that behavior, know of others in their families or the neighbors who have. I, this is a personal question. There is no obligation here. It, it, would anyone be willing to share that with Councilman Price, the experience? Raise your hand if you're, okay, Keith? Uh, I was driving with my brothers and we're three big black men, so we got pulled over for no reason at all. They had us step out of our cars and put our hands behind our back and they checked the car and they didn't find anything. There was no reason for, the, for us to be pulled over. There were no justified, justifiable calls. And I feel like we were racially profiled during that situation. Were you scared? Uh, yes, I was scared for not only myself, but for my oldest brother. He has mental illness issues. So at any time, you probably can feel some certain weight and slip out. And I didn't want my brother to get shocked in there. Right. Yeah, I'm sorry. None of, none, of us, none of us want that. No, not even a little bit. But then that leads me actually to a question from Isaiah. Isaiah. You had, Isaiah had a question about uh, now when we're getting into this whole idea of restructuring, reprogramming, and reimagining a police force, um, you had a question about something in regards to the police force. Yeah, um, I wanted to say, uh, well, ask, do you have any ideas on reconstruction, of, reconstructing a police system? How, we can look How do you restrict them? Are there things they should not be able to do, things they can do? Well, yes, and I think that's why we want greater civilian oversight of the police. Uh, you know, in our, in our system, uh, you know, the police are there to protect and serve us. Uh, and so it's up to us to make sure that the rules and regs are in place and that when police uh, can act in an improper way, that they're called on it. And so I think uh, greater civilian oversight is important. I, I think the police commission indicated that their willingness to do that. Also providing greater training uh, and more importantly, providing more opportunities for engagement and involvement. Uh, but we all have to be vigilant. We all have to um, hold the police accountable and other, elect and other elected officials as well. We have a role to play. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Has anyone had a good experience with the police? Have <laughs> at, you know, and see them at, at a, okay, um, Chris? Yeah. <laughs> Chris, a good experience? Do you recall what the experience um, was? I've had, I've had a good experience with police, but it was more so less than, you know, having bad experiences. But a good experience I can remember is when we were doing a toy drive and police were there to help us out a toy drive. So that was one of the instances. Mm -hmm. That's a that's a positive yeah. thing. So an expansion on that kind yes. of behavior. Yes. Right. Well, yeah. I, I know. For a second. I'm sure. Oh, excuse me. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, I just wanted to say that I kind of see everyone on both sides and their opinions, um, but I feel like we need to find a way to reach a common goal through the same way, whether that be peaceful or aggressive. We need to find one way to 
get that one goal, which is equality for everyone. Agreed. And sometimes, I mean, aggression is cathartic. Yes. I mean, you know, you have that pent up emotion. Sometimes mm -hmm. that's what's necessary. I mean, it shouldn't have come to this, but it did. So yeah. thank you. That's very intuitive of you. Very nice. Thank you, Chris. Um, there, I know that uh, Keith had asked something about, you know, multiple communities. Mm -hmm. Keith, something about protecting not just not just one community, but all communities and abuse that has taken place for. For multiple times, we need to address what's happening in the black community with our black women and our LGBTQ people. They are not being addressed as they should be in the media. People are getting arrested, pulled over, discriminated because of their gender and their race. And that's not just, I know that I see a video of a transgender woman who was beat by some little black people just because she was protesting with them. We need to highlight what they're going through too, because they're also black. Right, right. Well, you know, you're right, and, and the, 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 the cry for equality and for justice certainly has been focusing on African Americans, but uh, African Americans should not be the only beneficiaries. These certainly uh, minorities across the board, uh, women, uh, the uh, uh, LBGQ uh, community are all, can all be beneficiaries of a more advanced, more enhanced uh, kind of community participation and community involvement. Um, the focus and certainly there's been some focus on the African American community, uh, but that certainly is not the only community that has been impacted negatively uh, by improper police actions. And so, uh, the activities that uh, are taking place now, the demonstrations, and also the proposals for change, I think you'll see are going to be far-reaching. They they won't just impact uh, African Americans, but certainly Latinos and others uh, others who have been deprived and in need. Uh, because we are all in this together. I think that's the other message that we've been hearing. We're in this together. Uh, and you can't separate us, you can't segregate us, you can't uh, uh, try to divide us. We're coming together and we want change. And we hear you. Well, that's what I was going to ask. I mean, this is going to be for everybody and we're going to kind of roll through it a little bit because we're going to run out of time and you guys have a lot to say and I just wish we could spend the rest of the day together. But if I was going to ask you, what do you hope for? What do you actually, if after all of this, Hope for okay, go for it, Chris. Um, I hope for in itself more youth help, whether that be um, internships or any type of educational tutors. Um, I wish that um, youth can have more incentives where they can go to learn about business and be able to educate themselves and have financial status, so that we won't have to loot and we'll be able to go in and we'll be able to become lawyers and doctors. So we won't have to sit here and keep, you know, following this path that everyone has set for us. I think we need to level up and educate ourselves. Awesome. All right. Mm -hmm. How about, uh, is Margarita, do you have, what do you hope for, Margarita? Change. And that we stop saying all these promises that there's going to be change, but that something actually happens because it's like we keep repeating the same story over and over and we shouldn't have to wait for something to come out in the spotlight when it just it has to stop i think that we have to listen to the black community and we have to support them because they need us and we really have to make a change and not just say that it's going to happen, but actually make something happen for the better, for the future. Because we don't want to be having this conversation again in 10 more years or in 20 years. We don't want this to just keep happening. Yeah. Yes, right. I agree. Thank you. Kareeme? Can you hear me? Yeah. 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 What do you, what do you hope for? I hope for a system that actually holds police accountable um, for their actions. I hope that we find a way to not only dismantle the system from policing, but as well as like prison and industrial complex from going back into how deeply the um, issue itself is and making sure that we write, well, write our wrongs to what has been done to the black community in this country. Right. Okay. Okay. Uh, Robert. 
What do you hope for? I'm running out of time, but I really want to hear from people. What do you hope for, yeah. Robert? I think Margarita also for systemic change, so we won't ha be having this conversation in the future. It's been so long that the Black community has cried for help, and there's been little to no action taken to um, address their issue. You bet. Alondra? Um, I hope that the council member and everyone in office does use their power to empower and uplift the community by dismantling systemic racism that, that does exist in our city, such as the Pluto Prison Pipeline, hypercriminalization, and police brutality that's going on. Daniel? Um, I hope that somehow legislators can kind of more so focus on the voices of the youth and have more platforms like this one to really address how the youth are being. Like after all, as Councilman Price mentioned, the youth are the future and they are the present. And we should be listening to them on a level to even create legislation that's going to shape their futures. All right, Keith, super fast. I hope that change comes at any cost necessary. Amen. No, right. All right. Isaiah, did I get a chance to say that to you? Yes? Um, the same thing as him. I just really want to change and everything to get better for us, the black community. All right. All right. Well, I, I cannot thank you enough. You are all incredibly wonderful to have joined us today. You are very patient with us in terms of being able to hear and understand what you're trying to say. Um, and we listened and we learned. Yeah, and let, let me just, I'm just so proud, so proud of, uh, of you because you do represent the best of us. Uh, I, I'm excited to, to know of your enthusiasm, of your interest, you, and your commitment, uh, you know, and because it does take us, take all of us to, to really make a difference. And so uh, we are, uh, uh, we're counting on you, counting on you to make sure that this is not just talk. Uh, but that we put the kinds of programs uh, in place that are going to make a difference, that can impact the lives of not just you, but your kids and, and beyond, uh, because it's so very, very important. I think, we, as I said, we have a special time in history, a special chance to really make these changes uh, and to do it in a way uh, that we bring everybody along. And so I'm, I'm excited to be here, excited to have you uh, as, as students uh, in, in our city, uh, working hard, uh, being productive, being positive, uh, and contributing to the discussion on how we can make change happen for everybody. Again, thank you, and keep up the good work.